Hi, hi everyone. Good morning, and thank you for joining the panel discussion today. The topic for today's panel discussion is semiconductor alliances and IP partnership. And my name is Sanjay, and I'm a technology sourcing manager at Facebook. At Facebook, I'm responsible for researching emerging technologies for data center and looking over the new innovations that can either develop new capabilities or increase efficiency and finding hopefully the right partner to develop the technology. As I said, the right partner. Because in general, the JVs are complicated. Technology selection and finding the right partner is a long drawn out process involving many teams. IP ownership is a key issue for all parties involved. And then we have the open source embedded in it. Open source is our fact of life today. This again complicates the reps and warranty. So hopefully today's discussion will provide insight into selecting the technology partner. So we have real professionals on this panel who have deep experience in finding the right partners. And I'm looking forward to their insights, not mine. So we have Hiren Majundar. Hiren is a VP and general manager of Compute Business Unit at Global Foundry. Hiren has deep experience in product development and running business for various companies. Before this, Hiren was vice president at Intel Capital and managing director, sorry, managing director of IP and silicon products. So Hiren has been both side of uh, technical and management and has experience in corporate development, mergers and acquisition, making investments. We have Harish. Harish Bhardwaj is director of marketing in ASIC product division. Harish has a long experience in product development and managing the business. So he is regularly involved in evaluating the technology and determine what third I partners, third party, sorry, third party IPR partnerships that does need to run the business. We have John Tam. John is group director of marketing and business development, business development in Cadence IP group. He is responsible for solution pricing, packaging, along with partnerships and alliances with customers and partners. Finally, we have Jay Goldberg. Jay is VP of finance at Noodle. Also, Jay runs the Digit2 Dollars, an advisory company which advises high tech companies to achieve their strategic goals. Jay has deep experience in corporate strategy, merger acquisition partnerships, and has written books on this topic. So I'm sure you guys would agree with me that no company on the planet has all the technical ingredients and they rely on the partners to develop the missing pieces of the technologies. And often you guys are working on the partnership. So we can definitely you know, learn a lot from your experience on putting together the partnership. So Hiren, what is the first thing that you do in this process? What are the most important criteria for you when you are licensing the IP or acquiring the technology? It took us many years to come up with a robust methodology to become uh, partners with 100 plus companies that we license both hardware, software, and firmware IPs. I believe that there are four steps to working with other companies. First step is the whole boatload of requirements that you have to plan for, right? You have to figure out the schedule, you have to figure out the quality, you have to figure out the KPI or success criteria. You have to figure out dependencies, you have to look at IP issues. So that's the understanding of what you are after. The second step thereafter and, and, and following on is scanning the market, figuring out the right partners to go after. Then you have to get into acquisition of IPs, either partnership, pure licensing, sometimes investments or acquisition. And then very importantly, what we forget is the work actually starts thereafter. Once you decide, then you have to get into monitor phase, right? You have to make sure that the company you work with has people that haven't left the company, that IP development is going on schedule and with quality and all of that. So to, to wrap it up, Sanjay, I think um, the more quality job you do in understanding your requirements top to bottom, 
the better off the life will be once you do the deal and the IP starts coming in because silicon is expensive. To me, it's that first step uh, that's most crucial, which is know yourself, right? Know yourself, know, understand your own company's needs be, and be really, really brutally honest about it. Um, all too often, I think people underestimate the, the types of outside help we we need. Um, there's a lot of uh, not invented here syndrome uh, I've stumbled across over the years where companies don't want to admit that they have a, a, a dependency or something's missing. And there's always somebody internally who says, no, I, I can do that. Uh, and and uh, before you start going out and talking to external partners, it's really important to to have a very thorough self honest self examination uh, and, and 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 determine what's what's really the, the true situation you're in um, and, and that's you know it's know yourself that's the that's the most important part and I also like Harden, I really like your point about the, the second most important part is all right now the deal's done the work really starts that's I think something that people forget a lot too that's a really good point thank you I think you you touched on make versus buy aspect right are we better off making it inside? Is there NIH? Do we have to go acquire from outside? And be honest with yourself in the company. And there are a lot of yeah. issues related to that. So the, what you guys are saying essentially, you know, clarity, clarity, clarity in terms of, you know, what we are after, why we are doing this before we even, you know, go and talk to the partners, right? Correct. Right. One thing that I would add to it in terms of, you know, what Hiran and John mentioned about specifying the requirements, being clear about the requirements. Uh, coming from, I would say, specifically in the ASIC division within Broadcom, we, the development cycle for these products are like two, three years oftentimes. And if you are developing a product for a kind of an emerging market, the market dynamics changes. That means some of your IP needs and the technology needs may also change during that one, two, three years. So one of the key thing that I would also add to that is define your requirements, but also choose a partner that is willing to be flexible to adapt as the market dynamics changes. Uh, because, you know, if you take like self-driving cars or in a lot of the machine learning applications, we are dealing with kind of evolving markets, right? That means the needs can uh, change. That's one thing I'll add. I think you are amplifying on what Hiren and Jay said. It is the job starts after you got the technology and you are already watching out, you know, you need a partner who would be nimble and flexible as the requirement changes. So then it goes, I mean, essentially then it is the second step that you have mentioned, you guys have mentioned so far in, you know, the due diligence, finding the right partner that that is most important in, in this, in the second step, right? The first step is requirement. Know yourself better, as Jay said. And then, you know, when you have the clarity, you go into the market and the, your partner has to be flexible and the job starts after the integration after getting that technology, yeah. So John, uh, I mean, I'm sure from your point of view as, uh, as being both on the consumer side and the supplier side, you look at few, probably few different parameters in terms of, you know, the first thing when you do finding the right partner. Yeah, you know, I'll continue on and, and kind of dovetail on, on what was said by Harish, right? They've, they, you know, obviously they have a, a tremendous, tremendous amount of experience you know, in really uh, working with partners like ourselves in basically um, evaluating, you know, all the necessary criteria um, for the right partners. I mean, because during the design cycle, um, the requirements do change. You know, all the cu customers and, and partners we work with, they certainly have the ability um, to, you know, develop, you know, all of these IP internally. It's just a question of prioritization and, and focus, right? And so really, um, you know, the evaluation criteria and the process to, you know, finding the IP, you know, goes beyond um, saying, you know, are the features and functions enough? It, it goes beyond that and it goes into, you know, do they have 
not only the willingness, but the ability to be flexible and, you know, uh, uh, potentially customize, you know, the, the features and functions, you know, as we evolve, you know, during the design cycle over the course of the next two or three years. You know, in terms of you, you probably work across a swath of customers in the industry and then your customers come in, hey, we have a change in the scope. And then you have to balance between, you know, uh, running the business, executing on your product map that you have set, and then the customers comes in, hey, can you, you know, change this? And then, you know, how do you, how do you juggle this situation where you don't want to disappoint, you know, the customer in-house now, and you don't want to disappoint, you know, people that you committed for future development, right? How we work with our partners to ensure we minimize the kind of the downstream customization uh, requirements is upfront. We try very hard to fully understand what their needs are uh, beyond what they're asking for, right? And from there, you know, we really try to work with them in an open, transparent, and honest way in terms of saying, you know, downstream, these are some of the things that you may need to do on your end, on your design um, to, you know, fit what you're trying to do with, with, you know, in this partnership with our products. Right. And so the whole, I think, exercise is to fully understand the complete requirements in the full system. In terms of the, the point that is being reinforced here is, and is around getting the requirement, right. It is not just for Harin, Harish or Jay, it is also for, you know, supplier like Cadence to understand very well customer what they want because you don't want to deal into issues later on, right? So it is a due diligence on that front is very important. I think picking the right quality supplier and the experience of supplier really matters because the higher the experience and track record of fully validated IP on silicon or whatever goes a long way. And as the old adage goes, you know, the cheapest is not always the best. And so I think the the, the functions that some of us have led or lead, uh, you know, Harish in terms of incoming IP validation uh, goes back to validating what track record the supplier has in terms of, you know, taking their offering all the way up to full production. And, uh, you know, you don't want to have a failed silicon or a failed FPGA because the market is brutal in terms of go-to-market timeline and pressure. So I think you have to strike a balance between the cost versus uh, overall cost. Uh, and, 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 and it's something that we all have to look out for in, in, this, in this journey. So the way I look at the due diligence is kind of tangibles versus the intangibles. The tangibles is some of the things that we've discussed about does the technology slash IP meet all the minimum requirements that we want? Is the quality there? Is it silicon proven? What is the risk of respin because of using this technology and the overall licensing cost or the support cost? All you could list out and say, I call them as the tangible. What I look at on the intangibles is, for example, is the partner committed to a longer term roadmap where this helps to allude to my previous point is that means not only us the ip provider is also looking at the roadmap looking at the market and see what's changing what's evolving how they have to adapt to that that means there are multiple eyes on the goal so there it helps uh, and the second most important intangible to me is is the IP is the organization built for IP support? Uh, for example, coming from a big uh, company like Broadcom, say sometimes we look for an IP. Uh, it may be available within some other uh, business units within uh, Broadcom, but just because it meets the technical requirements, just using it in a product doesn't mean that. I will going to get the support that's needed. So oftentimes, even if the IP is available uh, readily within the company, we may end up using a third party uh, IP provider because then they're actually built for support. They understand what it means uh, to, you know, whether it's changing or tuning the IP and providing support, not just during development. It could be, you know, 
post silicon or a production instead of you know not in my backyard syndrome you are saying even if it's in my backyard i'll you know i'll go in neighbor's backyard because neighbor's backyard is more greener so <laughs> that's an interesting point of view how do we go around you know peeling off those details and what is this due diligence process looks like how do you make a decision in a big company or in a small company or similarly from you know supplier's point of view how do you make this due diligence or before you take on a partner maybe i'll i'll start and then others can chime in so i think as the experience of uh companies grow in working with ip ecosystem you have to create a robust technical business and legal framework through which you will go evaluate this companies i'll bring out i mean technical stuff to us engineers is very easy at the end of the day you will know your pre silicon requirements you will know your software firmware requirements you will know your post silicon matrix a lot of those things are very easy many times we forget that we have to pay attention to something benign as something called change of control for a private company you know if you are engaged in a private company and that private company gets acquired by your competitor and i'm just calling out one simple example where if you don't pay attention to something like that then you may end up in a situation which which may not be very happy if if the private company gets acquired by your competitor but i'm using that as an example that you have to have a robust framework a rushing into selection is not the healthiest thing you can do as the sourcing lead or the sourcing partner uh, you have to work through that framework and the trick is to balance your internal stakeholders who are pushing for time to market and and get to you know development and all of that versus you doing the diligence and it takes equal amount of finesse to convince and manage internal stakeholders versus the ecosystem diligence let me take the other side of that cuz this is something that's been I've been thinking about for the last few minutes is i tend to mostly work with smaller private companies and one of one of the big sources of uh called friction that i find from my point of view is larger companies take forever to make decisions um and 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 that's v- it's very hard for a small company to uh to to accommodate um you know i i tell most of the startups i work with if if one of the big big companies approaches you um just sort of i mean the the, the joke we have is the the ceo the, the big company can have as much of the ceo's time as the big company wants but they get 0% of my engineer's time uh until a deal is signed and and that's because what we what we what i've seen many times over the years is that is that big companies will come in and they say hey i want i want to license this from you i want to buy this from you um and then the decision will stretch out months and months and months and months and for for a small company uh dedicating real resources to that kind of opportunity can literally be life or death. And so I always uh and and I I'm not I don't want to assign moral weight to either side. Both both sides have their valid reasons for doing this, but I think it's it's something that's hard for people working in big big environments to fully appreciate um the strains that a 9 month decision process can put on a 20 person company. I think you are spot on Jay. I have seen both the sides of the fence as I have spent time in large and small companies. You are spot on and maybe it cannot be as strict because to win the customer confidence you still have to bring R&D on the table because the the customer is not going to have full faith without getting to know who are the people on the other side and uh, just see you alone is never enough is my experience but I think what you are pointing out is be very careful in investing your r&d with you know never ending saga of yeah. uh, analysis paralysis of larger companies and i think that balance is is very important for startups from what we've seen um you know having you know engaged in a, a a complete you know range from from 
you know, smaller startups on the customer side to, to kind of larger, uh, um, you know, customers. And, and, you know, we're also, you know, an IP group in Cadence, you know, we're quite a small group within a larger company. So, you know, we yeah, can yeah, yeah. But, larger, big. Um, but what we see is it goes all the way back to the very beginning when we talked about make versus buy. And so in some of the lar- our larger partners, our customers, um, because they're con- they're continually, they're, it's a nine month process to decide often uh, whether they're going to build their own versus uh, uh, buy it from us. Um, and at the same time, you know, as they evolve their requirements, um, they think, okay, you know, we can customize internally if we go with, you know, our company or uh, outside vendor, um, you get what you get, right? And so that nine months just is, is a lot of, it's not so much just the, the, the slowness of a big company, but is a continuing uh, um, iterations on, do we build it? Do we buy it? Do we build it? And then of course, it also comes down to, it's not so much the big company versus small, it's how much risk are they willing to take? Um, and if they're willing to take on a, a lot of risk, they're you know willing to do certain things, make quicker decisions. Uh, and if they're very risk averse, then they're going to evaluate something to death, right? So I think that's those are all really complicated decisions, and that plays into you know whether it's a six week evaluation or it's you know a nine months evaluation. I take what you're saying; it's a fair point. But I think there's a big difference. You, you pointed out that you work in a small group. And, and I get that, like small group, you can only do so much and everybody's time budgets are finite. But there's a difference between a small group and a small company, right? Because oftentimes, you know, if, if, a, small, if a small group's processes get brought, bogged down, then it just sort of deals go slower. In a company, if a small company's processes get bogged down, like payroll gets missed. And, and bills don't get paid, and, you know. There's a there's a much higher degree of of, of risk involved, and and so um, that's why I, I said at the beginning, it's really important for companies to understand themselves best. When you're a big company, you're going out and you're seeking IP from a third party, and maybe it's a small private company. Be honest with yourself what you what you need, so that you don't have to make a decision while a small company is waiting for you or while outsiders are waiting for you to go through that process. Because to, to not just small companies, but other size companies, that sort of nine month decision cycle can, can, just, it, it can cause other, other issues, right? It can, look, it can look very strange, it can disrupt things. And I, I think it's important that we, you, it, that's why I say it's important for companies to get aligned ahead of the process so we don't have to go through that midstream. Yep. Uh, Jay, I think expectation management and executive alignment on expectation management, including timeline, the KPIs, the, even some notion of business discussion ahead of time is, is paramount for all companies, small or large. There is no question about that and probably even more important for smaller suppliers. I see two dimensions to this thing. For example, me in my role, I'm working with my customers that's evaluating us as a silicon partner, right? That process alone can sometimes be a one month process or it could be a nine month or one year process before they decide, okay, I'm going to work with Broadcom, right? That evaluation, the same time, I'm also working with, okay, who are for this silicon, who are the IP partners that's needed? So what I want to highlight is depending on kind of where you sit in the not necessarily a food chain is probably not the right word, but there is negotiations happening at different level because my customer could be saying, okay, he's negotiating with a service provider somewhere to say, okay, what does that contract look like? Based on that, he's negotiating who is the silicon partner I'm going to choose. So oftentimes, um, individual negotiations are probably part of a larger business negotiation that happens. And I want to say my role, I see uh, you know, selling myself as our solution that's taking one month versus nine months at the same time, you know, choosing a partner, IP partner also takes, you know, sometimes long time. So I don't know whether it's the nature is aligning even in the business with the nine month cycle. So probably that is the 
<laughs> like uh, both at the nature and the business so i would feel a little bit on you know uh, what both um, hiren and harish you guys mentioned in terms of having a framework so hiren you know if you can share some of the insights what this framework looks like at a big company when you are going through this decision making process yeah i think um over the years um we learned through the battles through some mistakes what a good framework looks like to us in a large company framework serves multiple purposes first it helps you avoid uh, the trap of make versus buy because internal engineering teams always love to develop things and they believe that they can develop everything under the sun and uh, more often than less you find yourself in a situation that if you go down that path maybe things come little late and not le- not exactly up to the mark versus an experience of a uh, experienced partner who is in the business and livelihood depends on developing that ip for multiple customers use and time to market and all other benefits so we learned that the framework had multiple parts as i mentioned before first is a technical part so in technical part we learned over the years and revised this framework to sort of look at everything from um, you know or at an architecture level what are the key things you look for at rtl level what are the key things you look for um, if you have any fpga any post silicon implications for that specific ip firmware all of that so you have um, a technical list of checkpoints and measurement criteria that you have to develop and the criteria uh, elements could be a broad framework the exact kpi or the measurement criteria can vary based on the specific ip if it's a software ip then you know there are some different elements but you know so you have to develop a robust technical framework that looks at the full span of what that ip will do for you and 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 develop that framework we also created a scoring matrix uh and allowed a guideline as to score this 10 if you achieve or if you see this and over the years the finance the general managers all came to appreciate that they could look at the scoring and say okay how is my risk versus reward threshold is so we actually created a uh, a sort of a framework that uh, the gms and the finance leaders could also cope up with in in their overall business plan then you have what I, what we called as the legal and the business framework right and you have all sorts of uh, challenges you need to look out for you know is ip clean is it infringing on other um, ips right you have to uh not just rely on what the vendor is saying but you have to do some diligence on is the ip clean do you have concerns with private companies have you looked at some aspects of their financials the worst thing you want to do is you went with a startup and that startup went bankrupt or you went with a large company and the ceo was not interested in maintaining that ip so you have to have the business and legal aspects and there is a framework related to that and then you know you also have to have you know sort of a validation framework right in terms of and by validation i mean you know customer diligence you have to talk to other customers of that ip you have to look at the track record so we created over the years this framework we put some measurable um, outcome for each one of those questions and then we applied some scoring and we start from there allowed us to remove the emotional part of nih or make versus my challenges through that framework um, but i'll pause so, here so sounds like this is a rigorous i mean this is a quantitative process also not just the qualitative elements the quantitative elements so sounds like you know this is you know it's a matrix on one side you have the risk and other side you have the cost and third side you have the performance right so i mean it's probably in a way of you know a judgment call between you know, managing the risk getting the right performance paying the right price uh, for this this technology right so i mean now we have gone through this framework 
and you know some few candidates will filter out from this framework one two three however many candidates and we start working on now closing i would say move the process into the next step and we say now we are going to go with you know candidate a as a main candidate candidate b, b as you know uh, second candidate in the process so in this process what are the consideration when you are you know looking at this transaction or alliances what i mean by you know if you can highlight you know, some of the consideration we already touched on it but this is more now more in going in the legal phase of the of the deal so jay if you can you know speak from your experience in you know uh, working on these transactions uh, and the licensing what are the considerations you know for me for me the big question is always wh when do you when do you bring in the lawyers right um when do you bring in the you know sort of it's like the, the three stages of grief it's the engineers the business people and the lawyers i like to work through those stages very deliberately right with have the engineers involved and get as much as much closed as possible get the business people then later on to, to put in a term sheet and then and then lastly uh, bring the lawyers in to, to put a, a contract around that sort of satisfies everybody. I find that if you get those steps out of order, bad, bad things tend to happen. Um, you certainly don't want the, the lawyers leading the engineering discussion and the engineers leading the contracting and the papering. Um, and I've, I've seen all sorts of permutations of that, but I think if you, if you keep to that sort of that, that ordering, um, you sort of, uh, everybody get, tends to get reach alignment more quickly. One thing I want to add from, you know, uh, you know, what you both Hiren and Jay mentioned in terms of in this due diligence phase is one is, you know, as a system company, it is also the compatibility with the system itself. You know, when you are getting an IP, getting a chip or whatever, how does it, how it is going to compatible with the rest of the system? That is one of the variable at a system company that, that we get to see from our point of view. So John, from your point of view, when you are putting together, you know, when you are moving to the next phase, third phase, which uh, Jay mentioned, the legal phase. So what are the consideration from a supplier point of view? Uh, you know, what are the protection a supplier is looking for when trying to close this deal? Just to reiterate what, what Jay said is ordering is critical because obviously, um, if you don't have a full understanding and, and get the negotiations on the requirements and the trade-offs right, then your you know, lawyers on both sides are going to iterate because the, anything that's not entirely uh, spelled out, you know, is left out the interpretation, you know, that gets expanded like you wouldn't believe. And I think even though if lawyers on both sides of the partnership, you know, are, are company lawyers and, and aren't paid up by the hour, it feels like, you know, they behave or they're trained to kind of, you know, work by the hour and it gets extended to from days to weeks and everything is redlined and re redlining. And after a while, you know, the arguments are down to the language versus the intent and the actual requirements. So I guess the ordering and not only ordering, but getting every step right on the engineering side is critical in getting something done fast or, or with a reasonable time. Right. And so in terms of licensing, um, I would say legal is probably the biggest uh, challenge. Um, more, you know, getting the contract right on legal terms. Um, the, probably the easiest one is is kind of the pricing negotiations. Right. Um, and, and the terms of, you know, you know, how many licenses, the royalty that seems complicated, but that's probably the most simple one. Um, I would say on the legal side, the challenges are you know, indemnification, you know, uh, uh, us as cadence you know, as a vendor, we want to be protected uh, as much as we can. Um, and it's very different in providing a software tool where the customer uses, and if they do some damage, it's kind of on them, right? But when we sell them a piece of the design and it goes out into the marketplace, you know, we want to, you know, have as much coverage, um, you know, for, you know, intended and unintended consequences downstream when the product gets sold and it gets sold typically in, you know, the millions and millions of, of units. So, you know, indemnification, limits of liability, 
Lorne G, um, you know, those are all, you know, critical in getting a, a, a contract, you know, aligned and, and closed. Um, and then of course, uh, modification rights, right? Um, depending on how much customization, uh, uh, you know, one partner needs, uh, that's going to determine how much modification uh, they're going to want. But that causes a lot of unintended issues with um, if they make modifications, can we support those modifications, right? How does it impact other customers that are also licensing that IP? Um, are we blocked from selling that IP once they make modifications? Because now there's claims to kind of the ownership rights. Now, are we blocked from um, you know, ever making those similar modifications? And, and you know, almost in every case, if our partner wants to make a modification, um, we actually don't want to see it or, or, or have that uh, given back to us. And so that's also a challenge in supporting that. So everything from modification rights, um, you know, restricting the scope of, of, you know, who, whether we're responsible, um, you know, how much responsibility we have, you know, what are the delivery and acceptance criteria, um, all that comes into play. And so I would say, especially in larger custom, you know, partner to partner relationships, um, the negotiation on the legal uh, is often uh, longer in time period than the actual evaluation of the IP. In fact, probably half the cases that's, you know, I think people uh, um, leave that out or, or tend to overlook that. But, you know, we've had negotiations on licensing terms that, you know, have lasted 18 months. Yeah. So, Hari, uh, thank you, John. I think one of the key things that is often overlooked is, you know, in the joint developments is the development or the modification itself that you highlighted, you know, who gets to own it and, you know, how do you split that ownership? So Harish, you might have a very interesting take uh, in terms of you would want a protection of anything that you're getting from your supplier because, you know, sub, you know, customers would say that we did not develop it and you are responsible for the, you know, indemnification, anything that happens to this. Anybody from Africa also can get up and say, you know, I have a patent on this, right? So you would want a protection on whatever you're getting from. And other side, you would say, you know, when you are a supplier, you would want to give as least protection as possible for, you know, a transaction that can, you know, bring down the company itself if you give a full indemnification. So you might have a very uh, interesting take on this, Harish, being both as in the middle of the, the things and how do you balance this, you know, getting protection and giving protection? A couple of things. Uh, first, uh, I just I was just very curious about, you know, you know what John mentioned and everyone mentioned about the getting things in order, about the negotiation. It's very, very critical. One of the things that I have done in that that I find very useful before even getting a legal into a red line discussion. I try to create a table of okay, these are the high level terms. Is there an alignment between the two parties on those terms? Is there it is simple things like a payment terms or licensing terms? What is the indemnification? What is the limitation of liability? Put the itemize the table and say, what is your position? What is your other partner's position? And get a business level alignment before even go touch the uh, legal document because the, you straight away go into a legal redlining process. A lot of things get lost in translation and you're just spending hours, um, you know, sometimes even with language barriers, right? Whatever my legal is telling, I'm translating to somebody and somebody is telling something. So what I try to do is create a simple table that seems to uh, help in a simple statement. Okay, what is that you are agreeing to? Then we can go legal. Uh, uh, language. And the second part uh, to uh, kind of what um, John mentioned that uh, we faced is as a consumer of the uh, technology or IP, I would like the contract to be as generic as possible, right? Uh, it could support any EDA tool ecosystem. It could support any emulation uh, platform support, right? I would like it to be as generic as possible because I don't know what my customer would change or which customer would want. But I can always understand from an IP provider point of view, the contract 
they would prefer it to be as specific as possible. Are you going to use a, a you know a mentor emulation platform? Are you going to use a cadence emulation platform? So that debate is something I've uh, seen. It is always a difficult balance. Oftentimes you end up is like, okay, this is the bare minimum that you need to put as a specific and leave anything else as you know to be negotiated. And uh, lastly, coming to your point about um, indemnification with the IP partner versus our silicon uh, customer, it is, you know, there I feel it's almost always, you know, the food chain, you know, our customer wins. So depending on how <laughs> powerful they are, how much they twist our arms, it's usually that's the way it goes, honestly. So I'll, I'll in totally tangentially, I'll just tell you how I, if I were recently we were discussing with uh, uh, you know uh, one of our suppliers in uh, Taiwan uh, in Malaysia somewhere they're like oh you got to deliver this in you know five days instead of seven days and they were like you spent like three years to develop this product and you are negotiating two days with me. You know, what is two days versus three years, right? So the way I, the reason I'm saying that is it's kind of like where you fall in the food chain. It's pretty much uh, decides, I guess. The... Even if we get indemnification from working with a small company, you know, even if we are like Harish said, you know, a powerful customer can, you know, twist the arm and can get the indemnification. But does it really mean anything in a practice if you are working with a small company? I mean, Small company, if you if there is a litigation of un, running into hundreds of millions of dollars, it's just simply probably not worth it. So does it really mean anything? Does it buy anything for a big company? No, there's 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 no point in in a, a large company suing a, a tiny little company. There's, ultimately, there's no recourse. The company will probably can't even afford the legal bills, let alone the the some you know large penalty. Uh, and so. Uh, I, I think, uh, you know, sort of have to, a uh, part of the negotiation is companies have to balance off that risk reward and, and large companies have to think realistically about what they really want to accomplish uh, in, in seeking some of this. I think to amplify what Jay said, Sanjay, um, I would say the following. We used to run a process of game theory. Every vendor that we engage for the very first time uh, we would do a game theory. We would figure out, okay, if this vendor would lose critical talent, how would we survive and continue with our product development? If this company would go bankrupt, how would we survive? If this company would get acquired by a competitor, how would we survive? Each one of those will lead you to, how are you going to manage that risk? And you are better off planning for it. Get an internal alignment that, okay, 99% things will be fine. But if one of these bad scenarios were to happen, this is how we'll react. Then based on those reactions along the line of what Jay said, you put legal protections or semi-legal protections in place. You can put code in escrow. You can get right to the IP under certain circumstances um, against some payment or whatever. So you, you have mechanisms that you can put in place uh, it will never be risk free but at least you have uh, you go with your eyes and ears wide open that okay i took the risk to get some reward sometimes the risk would work out once in a while the risk may not work out and you you are prepared to at least deal with it the worst thing you can do as the supply chain leader is not have those contingencies identified and put the pro process in place with respect to how you will deal with it and get internal stakeholders aligned so now we have gone through the whole process and, you know, we got the technology and then have you ever, you know, find surprises later after you got the technologies? I'm not, I'm sure with the game theory, you guys have not. I'm mean, just for the audience benefit. I'm asking, have you seen other people missing things that, you know, you would like to share? I'll tell you one a uh, specific thing this happened like several technology world technologies ago we licensed uh, a ddr ip um 
uh, John, you don't have to worry. It was not from Canaan. Somebody else. And uh, uh, we got everything done and we thought we'd done all the due diligence. And as we were getting closer to the product tape out and getting ready for support, what we found out, this uh, IP supplier said they got to build a validation board uh, in the product context in order to deliver the final firmware. And we were like, okay, we just didn't uh, plan for it. Not only that, did we not plan for it, now we have to work with our customer to you know, release their more details to be able to build a card specific to validate an IP, which is like less than 5% of the entire chip. So it was, you know, you know this is a lesson learned, this but, is, you know, it's something the, I could think of. Yeah. yeah. In terms of the, even after all the due diligence that we go yes. through. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We had a, we had a, one of the interesting stories was before we, learned some of these lessons and put those best known methods in practice. We were working with a small vendor and uh, during 2008 challenging timeframe for the nation, this, this vendor uh, spiraled into bankruptcy because they had limited, limited customer base and um, the company got acquired by a patent troll. Uh, and then they, they had uh, pretty extortionist uh, demands from the larger uh, couple of customers in terms of, you know, allowing us to stay in production and all of that. So, you know, things do happen. And uh, uh, if, you, if you don't pay attention, you have to go deal with those kinds of things. Those are some of the worst cases, but, you know, by and large, our experience was people are fair. They want to do the right thing. They want to work with uh, you want to be fair as the customer as well. Uh, and sometimes, you know, empathy matters, right? You put yourself in their shoes and, and sort of understand what's the balance between what they can do versus what you want. And, you know, you can move forward. Yeah. So, John, as a supplier, you know, to pull a little bit on this in terms of, you know, have you seen from, you know, your side, your, your side, uh, this, some of the surprises that you, after gone through the due diligence and you know later finding the surprises from customer, I'm I'm sure you probably say it happens all the time. So we've seen you know I mean surprises. There never cease to be surprises, right? Day in and day out. Um, you know, in, in in many ways that what makes this is uh, you know entire you know ecosystem and, and, and partnership and alliances you know, in, in really designing systems jointly with multiple co companies and entities, it makes it more challenging and more interesting, right? Um, and at the end of the day, you know, going back kind of to what Harish said is that, you know, as long as there's empathy on both sides, you know, yourselves, your partners, uh, it works itself out, you know, and, you know, once the blame game comes into play, um, it, it makes it really hard. And so we've had, um, you know, bugs, you know, in our products, right? Customers have had bugs in theirs. Um, sometimes our IP works standalone. It's Silicon proven, you know, it's been out there, you know, in volume production with 20 customers. But, you know, once we plugged it into our customer system and it went to production or close to production, you know, there are volume issues, yield issues. And, and so working closely to, you know, find the problems and worry about recourse and all these other things later, I think that helps. That's going to be key. Um, and again, you know, we, we never cease to be surprised, uh, you know, even years and years in this business. Right. So um, and, and the key is empathy and, and really you know, cooperating to, you know, across the entire you know, alliance chain to get something working. And, you know, we've been fortunate that, you know, we've always had to work out, you know, our customers have, and, and partners have always been you know, very reliable and reasonable in that way, big and small. Jay, maybe you can, you know, add some of the tips and uh, and the success stories or some of, you know, surprises that you see, you know, from your experience. To me, the question is, how do we build, um, how do you build that kind of empathy and that sort of mutual trust? Because I, I agree 100 uh, percent, you know, <laughs> talking, what is it, jaw jaw is better than war war. It's always better to talk than to start blaming people, right? Once you start blaming people, it all sort of. Sense, and, and so 
I, I'm tr- I was trying to think of way interesting ways that we that that companies can build that empathy um, when things are good, uh, and and it, it's it's tricky. I think um, long, long history, long relationships obviously help a lot. Um, lots of past products, but what do you do in the absence of that? Is it something new, or or if you're a big company or small company, you're making big changes. Um, how do you start building that trust? And, you know, I, they're, they're sort of superficial things that you go, you know, you just socialize with, with your counterparts. But I think, I think structurally um, having, having a lot of clarity and in transparency in the process helps tremendously. Um, You know, if you're, if you're constantly, if you're, if you're going back and forth and there's delay on one side, uh, it always helps if if that delay is explained clearly. Oh, don't worry, it's not you. We're we're just we're trying to sort through something. Or you know, our our contract person is out sick. Or like real honest, open transparency helps a lot early in the when you do that early in the process. Uh, that gives credibility further down the line when things start to get a little bit tough, and I have to say, well, you know, the, my counterpart on the other side has been honest with me on these twenty different occasions in the past. If he says there's a bug and they're going to fix it, uh, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. There are very few playbooks on this, and I think it's important to sort of think think through those things ahead of time. At the end of the day, it comes down to you know motivations. If you have that sorted out between the partners, and you know you can work through many of the surprises that you get even after the deal or you know while you're executing, it is you know what is the motivation here? Like you just said, you know it's a long term partnership i mean the the ideal point is where you know you're working with your partner and it becomes your extended team that is the ideal place for both companies to be to have such a strong understanding and you know alignment of the motivation so i'm i mean this is such a fascinating topic you know i'm sure if we were you know live we'd have lots of audience questions audience would love to you know pull on your experiences but what i have you know captured the notes is essentially it comes down to getting the clarity knowing what we want from our suppliers from our partners and getting the requirement right internal stakeholders right and go through a, a in a structured manner go through a due diligence process and then you know select a partner which will go which is in it for a long haul uh, not a transactional it is actually a strategic alignment with both companies so i'm i mean i'm sure you know audience who will see this they will get some insights into the decision making process that is followed at these companies and uh, maybe they have a sort of playbook on how to go about this uh, partnerships and alliances so with that i thank you yeah, the panelists for taking time out and sharing this wonderful and very valuable experience with the viewers. And so hopefully next time we'll do it in a person and take audience questions.